Okay. Well, again, thanks very many thanks to, uh, for the opportunity to come and talk in Seattle, which is one of my favorite places. Um, uh, as you've already been hearing, but as we've been finding even more over the last 30 years or so, we've discovered that even tiny babies and young children already both know more and learn more than we ever would have thought before. This is a baby who isn't actually reading my book, but at <laughs> least is thinking about, uh, at least is thinking about my book. Uh, and Pat and Kislan talked about one important kind of learning, learning about language. Andy talked about learning from imitation. What we've been doing is studying an even broader kind of learning, which is developing everyday theories about the world, everyday ideas about how the world works, about how one thing causes another, how one thing makes another thing come about. Um, and we've known from work in developmental psychology over the last 30 years that children from the time they're born until they're four or five are developing these kind of everyday theories of how the physical and biological and psychological world works. The big question is, how is it that they ever manage to do that? Um, and that's a question that we haven't asked until relatively recently. Now, one way we can answer that question is by trying to look at where in the brain the, uh, this kind of learning takes place. But another question, in some ways as important or more important a question, is how is it possible at all for a computational system, whether it's a brain or another kind of system, to do this kind of learning? After all, children are not only learning a tremendous amount, they're learning it very quickly, they're learning it very accurately, and they're learning it from a very small amount of evidence. So the project that my colleagues and I have been engaged in for the last 10 years is to try and see what kind of computations could uh, baby's brain and mind be performing that enables them to learn uh, as much as they do, as quickly as they do. And that isn't, this is this? That's working. Is that working? Okay. Um, that isn't just an important question because we care and we're interested in babies and young children. Um, Ghislain mentioned this rather striking evolutionary fact about us, which is that we have a much longer period of immaturity, a much longer period of childhood than any other, uh, than any other primate does. And there's quite a lot of evidence that it is actually that extended immaturity that's enabled us to do all the things that we can do as adults. Um, uh, we just have a paper coming out in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society trying to make the argument and present some data that, for example, early pretend play, something that we think of as being characteristic of babies and children, seems to be connected to our adult ability to make counterfactual inferences, to have insights, to think about things in new kinds of ways. So it isn't just important to see how children learn from the perspective of knowing about children. That learning that we do as children is the learning that establishes our uniquely human capacities uh, as adults. Um, so the question becomes, how is it possible for that much learning to take place? How could we design any kind of system that could learn as much as quickly as we could? And what's happened is that over the past uh, 10 or 15 years, there's been a real revolution in philosophy of science and in computer science and machine learning, trying to design systems that could learn as effectively as uh, human babies do. And the buzzword for this is to think about these as being Bayesian systems. Um, and that's because they take off from the ideas of that's the Reverend Bayes, um, uh, 18th century statistician, but in the more recent versions have been much more elaborated. And it turns out that these Bayesian learning mechanisms provide us with very powerful ways of figuring out what the world is like based on the data that we see. And for the last 10 years or so, we've been exploring the hypothesis, the possibility, that what very young baby babies and very young children are doing is like these kind of very sophisticated Bayesian learning algorithms that we see in the very best, most effective machine learning systems. Um, so we think that the babies are Bayesians, aside from the fact that they happen to share the same haircut as you can see in this, <laughs> uh, you can see in this picture. Uh, now, if this idea is right, then what's actually happening is that babies are doing a certain set of probabilistic computations. This is actually the page from Reverend Bayes' notebook where he first articulated Bayes' rule. What's the basis of these uh, Bayesian ideas? 
fundamentally, what Bayesian learning algorithms do is to use the mathematics of probability theory to describe how an ideal scientist would test hypotheses against evidence. So essentially, the Bayesian idea is that you have some hypothesis about the world. You always start out with some hypothesis. You try to figure out what evidence would be generated in the world if that hypothesis were actually true. Then you can look at the evidence in the world and see how well the evidence fits with the hypothesis. Here, and Allison, come here just one yeah, second. I, I can't stand having you suffer like this. Okay. <laughs> oh, this is... Lean your head down just a little bit more. Move having it. a professional is... This I do well. Yeah, I won't do a paper on it. <laughs> do this. All right, Fantastic. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, so, uh, so essentially, the idea is that you and one of the important things about this kind of inference is that it's intrinsically probabilistic. So, what you do when you're doing a Bayesian inference is saying whether one hypothesis or another hypothesis is more likely, more probable, given the evidence. And it's been integrating probability theory into machine learning that's led to these tremendous advances in ways that machine learning can work. Now, uh, so over the past uh, seven years, we've had a wonderful project in which we had five different places at different universities, half philosophers of science and computer scientists, half developmental psychologists, collaborating to both take ideas from machine learning, ideas that people had used to actually build computer systems that could learn, and see if children were doing the same thing, and also to look at what the children were doing and see if we could use that to actually design uh, machine learning systems that could be as effective as the children who are, after all, the best learners that we know of in the universe. Um, the result of this project has been hundreds of studies at this point that have shown that very young children are, in fact, implicitly making the same kinds of ideal computations that you would use if you wanted to design an idealized learner, um, a learner that would be designed to learn as well and as effectively as they, as they possibly could. And in particular, what we've shown is that just like an ideal scientist, children are taking data about the world, probabilistic contingent data, and using it to draw accurate conclusions about what the world is like, about the causal structure of the world. So it's not just that children are little scientists. In many ways, children are actually better scientists than scientists are. <laughs> and that's something that I could talk about later on. In our most recent studies, for instance, we've shown that young children are open to a much wider range of hypotheses than adults are or than scientists typically are. So they're not just scientists. They're fantastic scientists. Now, to give you an idea of, you, you know, you might ask, given that um, my colleague Danny Kahneman got the Nobel Prize for showing that adults are really bad at probability and statistics, something that anyone who's actually had to, had to teach a statistics course or take a statistics course will say, how could it be? How could we be showing that these very young children and even babies are really good at using probability and statistics to draw inferences about sophisticated hypotheses? So I'm just going to run through one study to try to show you how we can show this. And I think this study is also important because you might ask, how is this kind of spontaneous learning from data and evidence, the kind of learning that a scientist would do, connected to the kinds of learning that we typically think of as learning, like the learning we do in school when we have a teacher who's explaining something to us? Um, so in this particular study, this is my student uh, Daphne Buxbaum, graduate student Daphne Buxbaum, and my other uh, computational colleagues, what we did was use uh, something that we know, f as Andy was saying, is a very potent form of learning for children, which is their uh, ability to imitate what someone else is doing. And as Andy mentioned, babies are imitating from the time they're born, and they're very sensitive to imitation. The question is, though, are children simply sort of dumbly imitating, doing everything they see someone else do, are they actually using the statistical evidence to figure out how to imitate intelligently, how to figure out how the world actually works, how to figure out how one thing makes another thing happen? So to do this study, what we did was we gave the children um, a little toy. And the toy, you could do all sorts of things to the toy. You could pull the handle. You could squish it. You could squeeze it. You could shake it. And sometimes when you did one of those things, the uh, toy played music. And sometimes it didn't. Sometimes it didn't do anything. And we showed the children combinations of three different actions. And sometimes they were followed by the machine lighting up. Sometimes they weren't. So it'd be something like pull the handle and squish it and squeeze it, and it plays music. But when I 
uh, shake it and squeeze it and squish it, then it doesn't play music. And we showed the children different sequences, statistical sequences of these actions. Here's the different sequences that we showed the children. Um, so each of these is an action, and the plus is whether or not the machine actually lights up. <coughs> um, now, if you were one of these ideal Bayesian scientists and you saw these patterns of data, you could make some conclusions about which sequences, sequences were actually most likely to make the machine go. So you could draw some conclusions about the causal efficacy of the actions, the way the machine worked based on this data. Maybe you guys can already get some guesses about this. So for instance, if you saw this pattern of data, uh, the likeliest conclusion is that you need to do all three of these things, A and B and C, squeeze and, and stretch and shake, in order to make the machine go. But if you see this pattern of data, even though you've seen the person produce all three actions, the intelligent thing, the Bayesian thing to conclude, is that actually this conclusion, you really only just need to do the last two of those actions. And if you see this sequence, you should conclude you really only have to do the very last one of those actions. Now notice that this isn't absolute, this is probability. It could be that you really have to do either EBC or DBC or ABC to make the machine go. And it could be that you'd have to do all three here. But the likeliest hypothesis, if you were being a scientist, is that it's only these last two in this case, but all three in this case and one in the other case. Um, and we can actually do a simple Bayesian model that will make those predictions in some detail. So what we did was we actually showed this to children. Let me show you a video of a child in one of these experiments. It is. Isn't it crazy? Yeah, I've never been with it before. So you know what's funny about it? It plays music. But I don't know how to make it play music yet, so I thought that what we could do is we could try something and see if we can figure it out, okay? You wanna help me see if we can figure out what makes it go? All right, so that's gonna be your game. We'll see what makes my new toy play music. Hmm, what should I try? All right, well, what if I squish it, and then I squeeze it here, and then I pull this ring. Oh! It's my music! Should I try that again? All right. I'll squish it, and then I'll squeeze it here, and then I'll pull this ring. Hey! I think I should try something else. Let's try something else. What if push it, and then I shake it, and then I pull this ring. <laughs> Do you hear anything? No, I don't hear anything either. Okay, now that went on for 10 more times, and you may have had trouble tracking exactly what it was she was doing. Uh, the li that little boy saw 10 more examples of those sequences of events, and then we simply I'm trying to make, it go. To make the toy go. Why don't you make it go? Oh, good job! <laughs> wow. Um, we figured it out. So that was a little boy who was in that BC condition. Um, and in spite of the fact that he had seen the experimenter produce three things, when it came his time, he picked out the most intelligent hypothesis, the one that was just those last two. And some of the children, by the time the eighth or tenth trial comes, are sort of patting their feet. And sometimes they turn to him and say, you don't have to do all of those. You only have to do the last, you only have to do the last two. And she sort of acts as if she's a little dim and hasn't quite figured this out yet. Um, in fact, interestingly, when we compared this ideal Bayesian model to the children, um, the responses were very similar. So children weren't always producing the double, that's the correct response, but they were producing it in the same proportion with the same probability that the model predicted. So the children were trying out different strategies. They didn't always do the same thing, but the kinds of strategies they produced were in proportion to the probability that that was actually going to be the correct hypothesis. And we've done some recent work which shows very systematically that the children are doing variable actions, but their variability corresponds to the probability of different hypotheses actually being correct. Um, so this is just one, as I say, of many experiments that we've done um, showing how sensitive uh, even three and four year olds, four year olds are to quite complex statistical patterns and how they can use those statistical patterns to extract causal structure from data. 
uh, in some experiments that I have slides for, but I won't have enough time to show you, as I say, we've actually shown recently that four-year-olds are better at doing this than adults are. So if you give adults this kind of task, what adults do is rely on what they already know. So the adults take what they've already learned, they do what they've already learned to solve the problems. They don't actually pay as much attention to the evidence as our three and four-year-olds do. And our three, -year three and four-year-olds are actually, they're actually like the young pre-tenured scientists who are willing to try the risky, unusual thing that might not pay off as opposed to those of us who are so concerned about getting our grants that we're only willing to do the things that we know are going to be, uh, we know are going to be successful. Okay. So this is an example of how children, just in their spontaneous behavior, are behaving incredibly intelligently, as intelligently as the best scientists. What happens when we actually try to teach them? So what we did, uh, as you may have noticed in that last uh, slide, Daphna, who was an MIT computer scientist and therefore very good at looking clueless, uh, was looking clueless. She said, I don't know how to deal, deal with this. Let's just experiment. Let's just try it and see how it works. Then we did the experiment, and now, uh, instead of just being clueless, she actually acted as if she knew what she was talking about. So the experiment was exactly the same, except that now she said, uh, I'm going to... <laughs> Sorry. Uh, she did not say that. She said, now she said, I'm going to show you how this toy works, the way any good teacher would. Well, what happened when she said, I'm going to show you how this toy works? Well, here's what happens. Here's the... Uh, uh, original condition, and here's the pedagogical one when she said that she knew what was going on. Well, that brilliant, intelligent, inventive solution completely disappeared once the child thought that the child was being taught. In this case, what the child did was always imitate pretty much exactly what the child had seen the, uh, the other person doing. So in this case, the pedagogical teaching, which we rely on so much when we're trying to educate children, was actually shutting down some of those uh, uh, alternative possibilities. Um, now, in some ways, this is a very depressing uh, finding. In other ways, though, it shows that the children actually are being rational. In some ways, they're being incredibly sensitive, uh, as both uh, uh, Pat and Andy were saying, to the social context in which information is coming. So in some ways, it's rather depressing that the children were simply kind of mindlessly imitating in the case where they thought they were being taught. In other ways, though, it shows that even these three and four-year-olds are making very fine discriminations between the kind of information that they get in different kinds of social settings. And again, we can do a kind of Bayesian model about how you should think about information when it's, say, coming from a random sample of what's going on in the environment, as opposed to when it's coming from a teacher who you think is picking out only just the information that's going to be uh, most informative. Mm. So in some ways this, uh, in some ways these findings are, are depressing because they suggest that teaching is making you stupider. In some ways they're, uh, in some ways they're encouraging because they suggest that the children sort of know when teaching is going to make you stupider or smarter. They're sensitive to the information and the social context in which they're getting information and are making different decisions based on the social context in which information is, uh, is actually uh, that's when they applying. Don't talk to anymore. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's when they've really become smart about, uh, um, except my lectures, of course. <laughs> but my lectures are just play anyway. So. Okay, so what are some, uh, what are some uh, broader uh, conclusions that we can uh, draw from all of this? Um, uh, the first conclusion is that they really are scientists in the crib, as, uh, as our book suggested. Uh, that's not just a metaphor. We can be quite specific about the kinds of scientific hypothesis testing and uh, uh, the way, these kinds of ways that children are using evidence to try to solve these solutions, and they turn out to be very much like the ways that the best computer scientists are designing computers to try and figure out uh, how the world works. Um, so that's the first conclusion. The second conclusion is that the way that these children are learning is a particular technique that gives them access to a very wide range of different hypotheses. People in machine learning talk about a difference between systems that explore and systems that exploit. And if you go back to this evolutionary point about why it is that we have this long period of immaturity at all, at, 
at all. One way you could think about it is that we have an early period when we just get to explore, we consider a very wide hypothesis space, we have lots of possibilities for learning without yet committing ourselves to acting in a particular way. And then as adults, we can take all those things that we learned as children and actually put them to use to do the useful things that we need to as adults. So my slogan is that uh, evolution has done this division of labor so that children are really the research and development division of the human species. They're the protected blue sky guys who we take care of, and adults are production and marketing, take the ideas that the children have developed and then put them to use. And the last thing to say is a conclusion. Um, one shouldn't conclude that you shouldn't teach children, but I think that doing this science can make us aware of how complex the learning mechanisms are that, uh, that children are using and could help us to design educational environments that would take advantage of just how incredibly brilliant children already are and could make sure that when we are teaching children, we don't simply make some assumptions about pedagogy that are actually narrowing down that brilliant learning that we see in children instead of extending and reinforcing it.